Hi, welcome to Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and as always, thanks for watching. Well, a flurry of activity this week on key parts of Governor Corbett's agenda. And then the other side, we will hear from the Citizens Marcella Shale Commission. All of that and more when Pennsylvania Newsmakers returns. This is Pennsylvania Newsmakers, a fast-paced, unrehearsed weekly discussion with and about the leaders who shape your world. And now, here's your host, Terry Madonna. Hi, welcome back to the program. Oh, I, I forgot to say Pennsylvania politics and government in depth and in detail, and it all starts right now. What's going on with the host today? At any rate, look, we got a lot of stuff to talk about, a flurry of activity on some of the big parts of Governor Corbett's agenda. Now, look, a caveat. Things are happening all over the place after the taping of this show. Much of the activity going on in the state Senate. Joining me is Laura Olson from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette and Mary Wilson from Pennsylvania Public Radio Journalists. All, all two, whatever. Mary, you wrote, a, you wrote a story this week that I thought was pretty fascinating. We're going to, before we get into that, tanning bed limits for kids? You know, 14 and under, you need what? A, what's that all about? A doctor's note if you're yeah. 14. Uh, or, or younger, and if you're a minor, if you're um, between 14 and 18, I think it is, yeah. you need parental, you need a parent with you a at the tanning booth. So is this whole point, is this sort of the concern about skin cancer? I'm serious, yeah, I wouldn't get yeah. near these. Have you, have you, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Have you gone to what, a candy bed? No, look at me, no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you? Sorry. Neither of you, you have? Mm -hmm. Oh my, I'm always, I'm too afraid, Junior Laura. prom, man. No, 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 well, I'm Italian, you know. I, I got a little, the I, time. Yeah, well, at any rate, but the point here is the legislature now it just got a, it's in a Senate committee. You know we'll see if it just passes. Just got voted out of committee. Just got voted out. It'll yeah. go to the full House, right, or right. full Senate. Full and then Senate. any conversations about the priority here on this bill? Yeah. I think it, it's it's less. Before people were considering a right. ban, um, the woman who was putting forth the ban, uh, Representative Rosemary Swanger, right. um, she she thinks her bill is better, but she'll support this one when it does go to the if it does go to the House. Um, um, I think I think it's just a. It's, it's, it's one of the like smaller fish to fry. Yeah, but, but you know what? It's an interesting thing because tanning beds for young people, cancer, you got to be really concerned about that. All right, Laura, I want to I turn to you. Look, we've got this three, I haven't read it. I read the executive <laughs> summary. A 300-page report from called the Liquor Privatization Report. Is that about right? Mm -hmm. I now, mean, I'd be fibbing if I said I've read the entire thing. But you read the executive report, word. right? Go ahead. I, I did read the executive report. So what's that report. about? Uh, it, this is the long-awaited privatization study. And when this came up earlier this year, the administration asked this firm, PFM, right. to analyze it, say, how, how is the best way to do this if we wanted to go about doing this? So unsurprisingly, they came back with a way to do it. Right. So uh, it, it kind of confirmed everyone's suspicions. We had been saying that this selling off the state's liquor stores and the system that provides that alcohol would raise somewhere around $2 billion. This right. says, depending on how we do it, somewhere between $1.1 billion and right. $1.6 billion. Not and quite as much, but mm -hmm. go ahead. But yeah, you know, still in there. And they basically back the proposal that yeah. uh, House Majority Leader Mike Terza has come out with, which would auction off um, both the wholesale and the retail licenses right. over a time period. And so that would be about 1,250 licenses under his plan. They say about 1,500 would be about right. Oh, but, but Gov Governor Corbett, Mary, has indicated some, you know, there is some concern about where these licenses would go in, neighbor, you know, in neighborhoods. There's some pushback, if not on the whole bill. You know, there, are, there is pushback from certain groups of people. We can talk about that. But how many licenses and where they go in what neighborhoods? Uh, Governor, I notice, has made some comments about some concern there. Is that right? Right, and there hasn't been, I, I didn't see in the executive summary a whole lot of detail about, about how you would restrict licenses. I think PFM, the Public right. Financial Management, which made the report, I think they were pushing for no limit on the number of licenses sold because they figured the market would determine right. you know, you know, how many you'd oh, need. I get your point. But they also mentioned that whatever money you made from, from auctioning the licenses could be put into law enforcement and yeah. things like that. I believe. And, so and regula regulatory things to make sure that it, I mean, there is this concern, the expansion. One of the other things, Laura, had to do with this tax uh, at the taxes that would be placed on a gallon of gas, or ga gas, gallon. <laughs> well, we, we can talk about that, too. It's another. That, that's another hot topic. That's another, yeah, another subject. Uh, 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 on the spirits, you know, on mm -hmm. wine and spirits that are sold. And that's a problem, too, because they're saying then it'll raise the price. Is that now a new line of attack from its opponents? Well, this is uh, similar to what 
Mr. Sturgis has put out that yeah. a gallonage tax would be the new tax right. instead of the Johnstown flood tax, the 30% markup, right. and the 6% sales tax, I think, covers everything. And so this gallonage tax would be based on the alcohol content as well as the volume right. of what you're buying. So if something's bigger and stronger, it's going to be more expensive. Yeah. And so for some things, that's not going to affect it as much. For a, a small bottle of wine, it may actually even be cheaper. Be but cheaper, for, but for yeah. other things, it's going to be more expensive. So and, and that would take away one of the big arguments of the proponents, however, that you know co competition will lead to lower prices, right? That's what they're saying, but I don't think there's so much consensus. Yeah. And even the PFM study said that there yeah. could be an impact on price with a d with new, you know, like a gallon or something. All right, talking about taxes, we're going to run <laughs> to a break. But before I do, this still seems, and I'll ask both of you this yes, no, maybe, still seems to have a tough road through the entire legislative process. Yes, no? I mean, this pointed out all the problems and all of the many details that we so need to work out. So Still yeah. no done deal? No done deal? Not by any stretch? All right. Vouchers, they, they're uh, moving. Uh, it's a big plan that the governor has. It's been sort of scaled back by a proposal in the Senate by uh, Senator Jeffrey Pecola. Uh, we'll talk about that and some other things when we pay some bills. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry, the statewide voice of business, and by the Pennsylvania Cyber Charter School bringing educational innovation and freedom to the children of Pennsylvania. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by ReconnectPA.org, supporting a comprehensive transportation funding solution, and by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. I welcome back to the program. We're talking about all things Pennsylvania legislature, I think, with two of the state's leading journalists, Laura Olson and Mary Wilson. All right, well, vouchers, uh, it's kind of a new wrinkle this week, introduced by State Senator Jeffrey Pecola, a really scared, uh, scaled down, maybe scary to some <laughs> people anyway, scaled down bill, right? Yeah, that's right. So this is a plan uh, in terms of vouchers right. um, would be restricted to kids, to students who either would be attending failing schools, one of the state's 143, um, or would be within the attendance boundary of one of those schools. And so it's for kids of low income. Low, they, they so we're talking about a voucher, a, Laura, a much more limited program. I mean, some of the uh, earlier uh, uh, proposals that had circulated in the legislature and ideas mm -hmm. called eventually for this to go to everyone. I mean, any student anywhere in any district, now that would be way down. This plan involves a relatively small number of kids, right, in a relatively small number of school districts, 17, I think, and you think most of them are where? In Philadelphia. And as you said, yes, as this was beginning to move in the spring, we saw it grow to try and gain some support add in the middle class students, some of the uh, families who make more money in the out years of this as this program grows. But now after, like what Governor P Corbett proposed earlier this uh, this month, I believe it was, he said, no, let's, let's do this smaller program, yeah. limit it. It also includes some charter school revisions right. and um, more money for the Educational Improvement Tax Credit, which is a scholarship right. uh, and they're going a, to give a more tax credit for businesses bus that yeah, contribute businesses to scholarship can contribute, programs. So. Right. Mary, businesses can contribute to scholarships in school districts, and that helps to, and, and that has escalated the, the, uh, more money Which in the bill as well. Which is something the House wants. That's something the House wants, right? Right, that's popular with a lot of people, and that'll mm -hmm. grow by $25 million uh, from 2000, 2012 to 2014, $25 million a year, mm -hmm. and then another $25 million. So its right. funding mm -hmm. would ultimately go up to $125 million with possibilities of additional 5% increases every year if there's high enough demand. Um, there's, there's enough money coming in from right. businesses. Yeah, we've had both proponents and opponents of this on our show. We'll continue to do that, you know, throughout the course of the fall when this legislation, you know, c continues to move through the... Le the charter school regulations are, uh, are, are controversial in some respects because there was the notion that a charter school could be created separate from and without the uh, support from or 
uh, actual uh, enactment by a school district, that's different in this bill. Is that right? Well, that's the way that, the proposal, uh, I that, say. that has been done so far to have a school district be able to say yay or nay because right. it's part of their money that would, in fact, go to those charter schools. And instead, the, the governor had called for a statewide authorizer, which there's been some support for mm -hmm. in the legislature, so a, one statewide body would be able to say yay or nay on these applications. I don't believe it's in, um, in that form yet, but there's been some talk about having um, universities Universities get involved mm -hmm. in some Colleges way. Colleges and universities have some other um, yeah. option besides yeah. just the school. Yeah, well, there districts. was a time, and just for everybody's information, when the public universities actually taught kids in elementary schools in their colleges mm -hmm. uh, in early childhood education, and that was fairly common in, in model or model schools that you know different names in different places. So that might be a. Th I don't know if they're still doing that or not. Do, do either. I don't know if they're still doing. Oh. I'm a product of one of those. Not not that particular <laughs> program, but of uh, public universities. All right. Before I let you go, I want to completely switch gears, and I know this is inside baseball. We're about soon to hear or to get a report about what the new boundaries will look like for state lawmakers. Is that right? Yeah. Is that coming up pretty soon? They're going to produce, they have to by law. It's coming on Monday. The Monday? That's now, right, right. And apparently some Democratic districts will be moved, and there's a, as usual, there'll be a fight over that. Did, 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 any inkling, anything you can tell us about it? I haven't done the reporting on it. I've just been reading the articles. That's right. Do you know more? Yeah. Uh, as we've talked about earlier on the show, I mean, so much of the population moved from the western half of the state to the right. eastern half that all of the rumors has been that someone in the Pittsburgh area was going to see their Senate seat basically picked up and dropped right. somewhere else. And so the, there's rumors that that could be, you know, someone like Jim Brewster, who is right. uh, new this year, someone um, even like Jim Furlow, whose district has lost a lot of um, a lot and of population. And what they'll typically so. do is take retirees. I mean, you know, if you're going to yeah, retire, it's easy because they don't have to fuss. They can just move the district. Exactly. And typically what's happened in the past, I think, that Republicans have generally gained because they've moved them out of one district is surely going to go in York, Lancaster, and Adams, mm -hmm. maybe one down in the Philadelphia suburbs, and then one up in Monroe County, as I understand. Is that sort of what you've generally been hearing? Sure. Is that about right? <laughs> and, yeah. and as you said, they, they want to make sure that's not a uh, already yeah. a safe Republican district <laughs> that someone's retiring in yeah, so that they right. can find another district that, yeah. that will help them. And then finally, them. before I let you go, we're still waiting, and there's no deadline on this mm -hmm. for the congressional redistricting ballot lines, right? And they're likely to do that. Before they leave, they don't have to. Is that right? You think that they uh, to do the congressional districts likely to do it before they leave for the holidays? I mean, literally uh, in December, we're they. That's the goal because in, in January they have to start petitioning yeah, <laughs> and getting their names on the ballot. And so um, there's actually a bill that's been filed that's just kind of the template that says right. first district will consist of portions of Pennsylvania. The second gotcha. district will consist of portions of Pennsylvania. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So it, it's a really well, enlightening bill. To fill in the, all right. Great, 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 great update. Laura and Mary, thank you. All right. We're going to hear from the citizens uh, shale panel. Uh, we'll get an update on uh, Marcella Shale. We'll get their view of it, which is more heavily, I think, involved in environmental concerns about Marcella Shale from one of their representatives after these words. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by Pennsylvania Credit Union Association. Pennsylvania Credit Unions, where people are worth more than money. To find a credit union that is right for you, check out ibelong.org. And by the Energy Association of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania's energy information source. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the State System of Higher Education. 14 state-owned universities, the state system is the largest provider of higher education in Pennsylvania. And by the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania, working towards a healthy Pennsylvania. Hi, welcome back to the program. Well, as I said in the opening promo, uh, we have Roberta Winters here. She's a VP, Vice President with the Pennsylvania Legal Women Voters of Pennsylvania. She was a member of the Citizens Marcella Shale Commission. We've had, you know, we're going to get all sides on this uh, uh, big important issue. Uh, uh, natural gas uh, extraction in our state, it's become uh, a big issue on so many fronts. The debate over environmental concerns, which we're going to get into 
uh, with Roberta. There's also the whole business of a tax. Uh, the governor's commission has recommended an impact fee uh, that would remain locally in, in local uh, uh, in the counties and municipalities in and around where the shale is extracted. But on the other hand, there are folks who think there ought to be a extraction tax uh, and, and bigger environmental concerns. Roberta, thanks for coming here. You're welcome. All right, Pleasure. let's talk a little bit. First of all, talk about the commission. Why did it? Why did you folks put it together, and what was its objective? The objective of the commission was to hear from citizens of the state as to their perceptions of what was happening in their local communities and its impact on their lives. I believe it was important because we felt that the governor's commission was perhaps too laden with right. industry influence. Yeah, is your point here that, uh, if I got this right, about a third of the m members of the commission appointed by the governor had industry, you know, were connected to the natural gas industry. Is that your concern? We were concerned about that, and also many of the people there were appointees of the governor. Of the governor. So you have this commission. You met, uh, uh, you had 100, I, on your report, 116 people testified. You heard from more than 400 people from 48 counties, and how long were you all operating? How, you know, five, six months longer than that? I believe we've probably been in operation perhaps eight weeks, two months, eight three weeks. months at so the most. So you did a lot of work. We did a lot of work <coughs> in a very quickly. short time. I believe we, we were formed perhaps in August. Okay. And then we were delayed because of all the storms and floods. <laughs> weren't and we so all, we were right? all weren't set we back. All? Yeah. And so our timelines have been okay. rather abbreviated. All right, let's go through some of the key points of your proposal for, for our audience. Let's talk about the taxation. Mm -hmm. You know, that's been one of the more controversial features. The governor's commission and the governor has now said impact fee enacted locally, the funds to remain local. What you, you want a, a broader and, and more substantial tax. E explain that. I think what the citizens have asked for is for the industry to pay its fair share. A part of that fair share would be a severance tax, as is, exists in West Virginia and other states across the country that produce a significant amount of natural gas. We already pay a severance tax in Pennsylvania. Right. We pay it to the other states that produce gas. Mm -hmm. I think there are also broader issues than what exists in just the local communities. Our air, our water, no, no boundaries. All of right. us in Pennsylvania, through pipelines and other expansion of the right. natural gas will feel the impact. We also need to spend some of that money on our environment and perhaps shoring up our Department of Environmental Protection to do the job that's right. needed. Yeah, I want to talk about the regulation of the environment in a minute, just to conclude this tax. Bit. So what you're suggesting is a tax on the amount of gas that is extracted. Do I got that right? Is that what the severance tax is? Yes. On the amount of cubic feet extracted from the well, you'd pay a tax on that. There are two parts to a severance tax. Okay. Sometimes there are parts of it that have to do with how it's assessed. Some of it's per well plus the extraction. Sometimes it's just the extraction. Just Sometimes it's per well. Okay. It, there are many variations on the assessment and also on the allocation, and that's why it's going to be such a controversial issue. All right, we're talking uh, with Roberta Winters. She uh, was a member of the Citizen Shale Commission, Marcella Shale Commission. We'll be back. I want to uh, get into the environmental concerns. I know that's a heavy, that's a heavy, that's a huge part of the recommendation. We'll, we'll get to that in a moment. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by Highmark Blue Shield, changing the way health plans work for business with a variety of plan options for employers and more choices for employees. Information is available at highmark.com. Have a greater hand in your company's health. And by the Pennsylvania Healthcare Association, the future of long-term care. Hi, welcome back to the program. We're talking about Marcella Shale with uh, Roberta w Winner. She's uh, on the Citizens Marcella Shale Commissioner. I want to talk about, get, get into some of the environmental concerns that you have. I know that there are a whole host of them. Go ahead. Well, I think it begins that Pennsylvanians take their rights seriously to clean air and water. And I think when we heard people in different parts of the state the people in, were concerned about the compression stations and the air and the noise. People from areas in the Northeast were concerned about their water supplies and the contamination of their wells. People in the South 
west are concerned again with the pipelines and the pollution. We're concerned about water supplies throughout the state. I think Scientific American said this in this week's edition that, you know, we're all flying blind. Mm -hmm. What we don't know, in fact, might end up hurting us about this industry. Uh, now, you're not, ag are you, uh, the commission isn't against it so much as you say, if you had to like put three or four sentences after that, slow down, uh, go slow ahead. Slow down. Right. Stop the expediting permitting of the wells, involve the conservation districts in oversight of the permitting, and put more boots on the ground. Mm -hmm. We need more oversight and we need more penalties that are real and conducive to provide the enforcement mechanisms we need to protect the air and water of our citizens. What about, uh, do, do you think there needs to be, uh, uh, you know, amendments to, uh, there's a whole bunch of laws, as you know, that deal with oil and gas. You know, some of them go, you know, go back 50 years. Do you think that whole substructure of legislation needs to be reevaluated? I think the current piecemeal process does not work in the best interest of the citizens of Pennsylvania. If you look in Lancaster County, you see lots of patchwork quilts. I would describe the industry's regulations in Pennsylvania like a crazy quilt right. full of holes. And because they find the loopholes and the waivers, it's really at the expense of Pennsylvania citizens that that process is going mm -hmm. forward. Now, what would, you do, what would you do to strengthen the Department of Environmental Protection? Well, I think they've been severely curtailed by budget cutbacks in recent years. I think we need to bring up their numbers, their training, and their continually, continuing ongoing need to keep up with the ever-evolving technological advances of the industry. We're dealing with things we've never dealt with before in this state. And that's because you would argue it's it, the increase in the number of wells, the impact that it has so quickly in a couple of years on the environment as well as the economy, the local economy, right? Yes, and I think, you know, to have 84 inspectors on the ground, that was in the governor's report at right. this point in time, that's no way to protect Pennsylvania's air and water. Yeah, one, 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 last, one last question. You want uh, a, a consumer environmental advocate in the Office of Attorney General, is that so you get investigatory and legal clout behind whatever they do? Yes, and I think one of the problems we have in Pennsylvania is there, there is a lack of transparency when there is a problem because right. of non-disclosure in the leases. We really don't know the real impact. When we heard from citizens, we know some of them are sick. Right. We know some of them are hurting. Right. And I think it's important that we have that kind of open okay. exchange. Thank, thanks for the update. Thanks for coming on the program. We'll see you next week for another edition of Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and as always, stay well.